COVID-19 carries both a coagulation as well as a thrombotic signature, which is important for individuals managing these patients to be aware of. We've reviewed the available literature and have done a meta-analysis looking at some of this data such that we can provide guidance to those within our organization and hopefully useful guidance for others. My name is Rob McBain. I'm one of the vascular medicine providers at the Gonda Vascular Center in Rochester, Minnesota. My name is Victor Torres. I'm a research fellow at the Kern Center for Science and Healthcare Delivery at Mayo Clinic, Rochester. In this video, Dr. McBain and I will provide a brief introduction to a recent paper published in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings Journal and called Anticoagulation in COVID-19, a systematic review, meta-analysis, and rapid guidance from Mayo Clinic. We perform a systematic review from November 2019 through May 1st, 2020, without any language restrictions. We found over 4,000 articles, which we screened and included 37 articles that met our criteria. We were looking for papers that described the frequency of coagulation abnormalities, described uh, laboratory values of coagulation parameters, or described the efficacy of pharmacologic anticoagulation. Uh, out of these 37 studies, uh, 36 of them were retrospective. Only one of them were prospective. And most of them were just described uh, either the values or the abnormalities. So in overall, we found that uh, laboratory abnormalities were very common in patients with COVID-19. Uh, the most common one we found is D-dimer, elevated D-dimer, as it was reported on average in 42% of patients with COVID-19, especially in those with severe uh, forms of the disease rather, uh, compared to non-severe forms of the disease. Uh, another one that was very common was thrombocytopenia that on average was reported in 28% of the patients. Uh, prolonged APTT and PT were also common in around 20% of patients, and either one of them can, uh, can be altered in around 28% of patients. So that's what we found in, in terms of the frequency of these abnormalities. We also wanted to know if these abnormalities were more common in patients with severe forms or non-severe forms of the disease, and we found that patients with severe or critical forms of COVID-19 had three times uh, more chances of having an elevation of D-dimer compared to patients with non-severe forms of the disease. And the same thing happened with thrombocytopenia with 1.78 uh, more times of, of being likely of getting uh, this finding when, when they had severe forms of the disease. Uh, we also compared what happened to non-survivors and survivors and found that non-survivors had uh, more than four times higher chances of get getting elevation of D-dimers than survivors. And thrombocytopenia, uh, it, they were very similar numbers. We also found that there was uh, more chance of getting DIC in those patients that didn't survive when a patient becomes infected with COVID-19, they need to appreciate that the infection can be quite serious in some individuals. And that, and that compli those complication rates can include venous thrombotic events and arterial events. These events are rare if the individual does not require a hospital stay However, if they do require hospitalization, and especially if they require ICU care, the event rates can be substantial. So patients need to know that it's not just the pneumonia and the lung infections that are a serious complication for this infection, but they also can have sometimes devastating thrombotic complications as well. And they need to alert their clinician and their care team to any signs or symptoms which would suggest a thrombotic event so that that, uh, that information can be acted upon. We have developed a guidance strategy 
for managing patients who are hospitalized with COVID-19. This guidance strategy walks the provider through the initial evaluation of COVID-19 patients and then helps the provider to determine how to manage that patient, whether they're residing on their floor or whether they're residing in the intensive care unit. This guidance includes how to provide venous thromboembolism prophylaxis, what doses should be included, and how one might risk stratify patients based on the level of the fibrin D-dimer. We've provided a care process model in our manuscript which will walk the provider through each of these steps and help to determine how to manage these individuals, including an assessment of the post-discharge rate of venous thrombosis and whether or not individuals should be on post-dismissal anticoagulant prophylaxis for a period of time. We don't know a lot about the risk of major bleeding in the setting of COVID-19 and how it relates to anticoagulation delivery. It would be important to understand these bleeding complication rates and also to determine which individuals would be at increased risk for bleeding complications, particularly if we are planning to increase the intensity of VTE prophylaxis and particularly if we are anticipating aggressive anticoagulation therapy. Furthermore, we don't know the ideal anticoagulation for these particular patients. We have a number of anticoagulation tools available to us now, and whether one antithrombotic agent is better than another is not known at this time. There are new antithrombotic agents coming uh, in the pipelines, and we need to uh, understand how these new anticoagulants are, uh, where they fit into the uh, management of COVID-19 patients, as this is a truly un, uh, atypical uh, thrombotic complication. Lastly, there are patients who have COVID-19 who are not requiring hospital stays, and the question is, should these individuals be provided some form of anticoagulant prophylaxis? We know that the rates are very low, but we also note that uh, the denominator, I, meaning the number of patients infected with COVID-19 is enormous. And so we need to develop a thoughtful strategy for the management of these outpatient, these ambulatory patients with this infection. In summary, COVID-19 infection carries an abnormal laboratory signature, as well as an increased propensity for thrombotic events. The magnitude of this propensity is not well established, and more longitudinal epidemiology community-based studies would be useful in better understanding this epidemiology. Going forward, developing strategies for venous and arterial thrombotic prevention will be essential to identify which patients should be provided this form of management and how long they should be treated for the propensity for thrombosis. We don't know which of the many anticoagulant tools we have available is the best for this type of infection and we don't know how long to treat patients if they've had a thrombotic event established. And lots of work to be done, uh, lots of epidemiology work to be done, lots of basic and clinical research uh, to better understand the thrombotic aspects of this disease. Dr. Torres and I would like to thank you for listening to this brief video tutorial, and we wish you all the success in managing your patients with COVID-19. We hope you found this presentation from the content of our website valuable. Our journal's mission is to promote the best interests of patients by advancing the knowledge and professionalism of the physician community. 
If you are interested in more information about us, our home page is www.mayoclinicproceedings.org. There you'll find access to information for our social media content, such as additional videos on our YouTube channel or journal updates on Facebook. You can also follow us on Twitter. More information about Healthcare at Mayo Clinic is available at www.mayoclinic.org. This video content is copyrighted by Mayo Foundation for Medical Education and Research.